Good morning. Good morning. This is the last day of February. I can hardly believe it. I almost wore a short sleeve shirt to, to work. What am I thinking? It feels like spring. And in fact, we might get some rain this afternoon is what I heard. So what is with that? Well, it's Michigan winter once again. So welcome to another uh, presentation of Lighthouse Christian Church on, on a topic that will help you move along in your spiritual journey. We'll hopefully get some practical kinds of things going for you this morning. God's going to be talking to your heart, so listen for those whispers. But uh, it's a good day. I think the sun was shining last time I looked, so that's, that's a good thing too. It's just an amazing day. I went walking yesterday and it was, it was so nice. It was just the sun was actually warm. It was so cool. So just a, a couple quick announcements too. You should have your March newsletter in your inbox, okay? So check your email or check your junk file or wherever um, our stuff goes. But, uh, and if you're interested in receiving our monthly e-newsletter, uh, just let us know. Either call the church or just sign up. You can go to our website, uh, lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com, and just check on that and send us an email, and then we'll capture your email address and send it off to you automatically, every month, no charge, free from Jesus. So, uh, also... We were given a gift of some eggs, some farm fresh eggs out front, and some apples uh, from Gary and Gail Wiltsey. So uh, it's a gift from them, and you can take as many eggs as you want to. There are some containers out there, so take some eggs and apples and, and have yourself a feast. So um, thank you, Gary and Gail, for that. And Jesus. And Jesus, yeah. Uh, I think that's about it. Let's start with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you for this most amazing day. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty that surrounds us, for the beauty that you place inside of us. Awaken us, Lord. Open our eyes to that amazing presence that you are all around us through our family and friends on this island, through the trees, in the, the warm sunshine that hits us, even in the flakes of snow. Help us to have our eyes open, Lord, to your beauty all around us. Help us to take steps to walk into that reality that you have prepared for us beforehand. Help us, Lord, to learn in this journey the ways in which we can come closer to you, and we thank you, and we praise you, in Jesus' powerful name, amen, amen. Well, to start off this morning, we're going to sing a song, and it's all about getting closer to God, and as we get closer to God, we draw closer to that wonderful reality that Jesus has prepared for us, that joy, that abundance, and that peace. And you can stand if you want to. You can sit if you want to. Um, you can march around. I'm going to grab a flag because this song is worthy of a flag. Take a look closer. Try going back to the library and then double clicking on the top one. Okay. Let's see.
that's awfully stubborn. If Jesus loves me, this I know, if that simple children's song is the goal of our lives, to truly understand and embrace that, and everything else changes because of that. Jesus loves me, this I know, is our goal. 
This is our response. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. seven days a week, on good days and bad days, on happy days and sad days. He loves us all the time. So today's message is basically about opening our eyes. It's not just about our physical eyes about the eyes of our hearts.
off of our eyes take the haze out of our vision help us to see clearly Lord the path that you want us to walk the reality to which you call us help us to stop running away so much open our eyes Lord in some new ways surprise us with the reality of your love Lord in Jesus name Before I forget this Sunday, I wanted to show you the second of the two different mission projects that we're involved in. And the Holy Spirit just reminded me not to skip that again. So it's called Healing Art Missions. And it's a, a mission that we've supported in Haiti under the guidance and direction of Tracy Lang, Judy Lang's daughter. She's a doctor there who's been there for years and years and years. And the video that I found is, I couldn't find something a little more contemporary. So it describes some of the uh, work that they do, but um, it gives the basic idea. It's not only a medical mission, but they've expanded to a number of other different things also. And it's all to support the people of Haiti, uh, a, a broken, uh, broken society and infrastructure. Uh, and this was, this video I believe was taken just after uh, the earthquake that they experienced uh, a number of years ago. So John, can you cue that up? Is that Healing Art Missions? When we were ready to leave, there were lines of mothers and sick babies and they were all wailing because they had no access to healthcare after we left. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. And life-changing for Dr. Tracy Light Carafa. She came back to Granville's Wells Hills Family Health Center and immediately worked to raise support to create the Healing Art Missions, the goal to set up a permanent health clinic staffed primarily by Haitians in the town of Dumay, just outside Port-au-Prince. It opened in 2000, seeing 500 or more patients a week. Tracy has been back to train, supervise, and treat over 40 times, but the trip made just two weeks after the January earthquake was devastating. From the fatal collapse of the St. Joseph Home for Boys, where Tracy and coordinator Paul Hammond had stayed many times, to the sight of children without limbs, and the stench of ten cities where death was never far away. I saw a baby that had diarrhea, and his, or his grandmother brought him in, and I asked where the mom was. She, she was back in the tent dying. Healing Art Mission supports a 24-hour clinic, school, and elder care center and is funded by private church and service group donations. Tracy tells me that other crises across the world have turned the focus and much of the finance away from the devastated and unstable island nation. People that had sent end of year checks, they sent checks two, three times as much as they usually send end of year for about a three-week period, and then it just stopped. But Tracy and Paul keep working. Neither could tell me if the nation can ever come back. So when I asked them why do they care and why should we, they said because the world can learn from the people there. While it's the most dysfunctional country I've ever worked in in my, country, in my life, it's also um, uh, some of the most beautiful people that I've met.
So please, keep collecting your change in your world change containers or piggy banks or whatever you're using, Tupperware, uh, for our collection coming up at the end of March, starting tomorrow. Uh, we'll be collecting the last Sunday in March, which is also the 28th. Happens to be one month from today. So we'll be collecting for Healing Art Missions and also for the Water Project, which establishes wells all around the world. Pure drinking water, which is the world's number one problem, number one challenge. Probably the most important thing that we can learn in our spiritual journey is to learn to let go of illusion and to embrace reality as it is. The most important thing I think that we can do in our spiritual journey is to let go, to release illusions in our lives and to embrace reality. And it's hard to do that because oftentimes when we say the word reality, we think of harsh reality. We think of things that come at us and things we have to brace ourselves for. But the reality that Jesus talks about is a whole different reality. The way that he defines it, he defines it as the kingdom of God. And it's a place filled with abundance. It's a place filled with joy. It's a place filled with surprise and goodness. It's a place filled with life. And that's the reality that Jesus presents to us. But we continue to persist. We persist in holding on to our own version of reality, which is an illusion. Many parts of it, at least, are illusions. So letting go of that illusion is so, so important we're going to talk about that today. And I'm going to start off with a spiritual classic that probably illustrates this better than anything. Here's a clip from it. Take a look. The Wizard of Oz, it's about following illusion. Remember Dorothy lands in Oz, and you know it's all color and everything, and the little munchkins are singing around and everything. And her whole goal, the whole premise of the story, is she has to get to the Emerald City so she can get home. And that's her whole thing, is she has to find the Wizard of Oz and get to the Emerald City, and the whole journey, the whole movie, is predicated on that. She meets these friends along the way, made of straw and, and tin and all of this. And if you remember at the end of the movie, remember at the end of the movie that uh, this guy, he's just a poor wizard, but he's a salesman from Kansas. He, he has a big balloon to get back to Kansas. But then the mishap is that, sorry, this is a spoiler. If, if you haven't seen the movie, cover your ears now. But 
he's got this balloon to get back to Kansas, and he gets inside, and just as he's beckoning to Dorothy, somehow the ropes get loose, remember? And he starts floating away, and she goes, no, wait, stop. And, and he starts floating away, going, I'm sorry, Dorothy, I'm sorry, as he goes into the distance, and all hope is lost. Until Glenda, the good witch, all dressed in white, comes floating down, and, and she says to Dorothy, and this is really important, okay? She says to Dorothy, she says, you've always had the ability to get home. You've always had the ability to get home. And Dorothy goes, how? And she says, look at your slippers. And you know the rest of the story. She clicks them together. There's no place like home. You've always had the ability to get home. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because home represents that place in Christ where we are truly ourselves, where we find that source of joy, that source of peace, that source of purpose in our lives. That's home. And you always have the ability to get there. But it will take some effort on your part, because it means letting go of all the stuff that we're holding on to, the stuff that we think is home, the stuff that we think is reality, even your best estimate of what good life is all about absolutely pales in comparison to what God has for you. No, I'm not talking about heaven. I mean, heaven's a whole different thing. But even life here on earth, that God wants us to live in a fullness of life in the here and now, in the practical, everyday stuff, in our work life, family life, relaxing life, every, every aspect of who we are. God wants us to live that abundant life. But it means switching our perspective. It means releasing some stuff that we're holding on to. Illusions about what we think we have to do to be happy. And then that's when the magic takes place. Well, besides the Wizard of Oz, there's another story that really shows this whole illusion, letting go of illusions and grasping reality in a powerful way. And that comes out of the end of Gospel of Luke. And if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, it's the day of Christ's resurrection. It's Sunday morning, it's Easter morning, and everybody should be happy and, and jumping around and what a great celebration, but it's anything but that. Let's take a look. Luke chapter 24, right at the end of the gospel. We're going to start at verse 13, the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 31. I'm going to read this. Follow along with me. Listen to this story. It's an amazing story. Only Luke has it. Mark refers to it briefly in Mark chapter 16. But Luke's got the story. It is so cool. Behold, on that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you were bouncing off each other as you are, as you are walking? And they came to a stop, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happened here in these days? And Jesus said, what sort of things? And they said to him, well, those about Jesus, the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. 
also some of the women among us left us bewildered when they were at the tomb early in the morning they didn't find his body they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive and so some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as exactly as the woman had said but we didn't see him then he said to them oh unmindful ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to come into his glory then beginning with Moses and all the prophets he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures and they approached the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going further and so they strongly urged him saying stay with us for it's getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over so he went in to stay with them and it came about when he reclined at table with them that he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and began giving it to them and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he was hidden from their sight and they said to one another were not our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road and when he was explaining the scriptures to us and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them saying the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon and they began to relate all their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them at the breaking of the bread they went all the way from from Emmaus back to Jerusalem and it was night and if you were smart if you had half a brain you never traveled at night because there were robbers and all sorts of wild animals and crazy stuff up on the road. Emmaus was like seven miles. They went seven miles in the evening all the way back because they were so excited. They didn't even think about the dangers. They probably ran half the way. And when they got there, they explained all of this stuff. But what Luke doesn't mention that Mark does is that even in all their excitement and all of this, and even though they, they saw the empty tomb and the, the 11 were, were trying to figure out what was going on because they didn't believe the women, right? Oh, not the women. And then even after they saw stuff, even after they saw the empty tomb, they were all kind of confused and everything. And Mark says, even these guys from Emmaus, they didn't believe them either. What a crazy way to start Easter, the very first Easter. All it is is bewilderment and confusion and anxiety and what's going on and our lives are out of control and I'm afraid and they lock the doors. That's how they end Easter evening. What a great day of rejoicing. But there are some things in this story that are really, really important to key in on. Especially this whole idea of letting go of illusions and grasping or embracing reality, what's truly real in our lives. Because Jesus said in John chapter 8, he said, he said, when you truly embrace what is real, you're set free. You're set free. And in a way, set free to go home to that deep place, that place where you belong, that place where you can be yourself, that place where you discover new things, home. And Jesus said, you're set free. Because the problem is, is that we tend to be addicted to our own version of reality. We tend to hang on to that. And you say, well, we usually pass that off to other people. They're the ones who don't have, they're all screwed up in their minds. If they only understood what I did, you know, they only saw things as clearly as I did, you know. And Jesus just kind of laughs. Oh, that's really good. Because we're all living in some sort of illusion. And that's, that's our journey in each one of us as we walk our pathways with Jesus. As he begins to show us lovingly. Those places where we've been holding on to the wrong ideas, the wrong concepts. Whether it's about God, you know, 
for a lot of us, God is like the old Wizard of Oz, you know, with the flames coming up. This is the great and powerful of Oz. Bow before me, you underlings, you know, and all of this sort of stuff. And it, in reality, it's just a man behind a curtain, you know, yelling into a microphone. And it takes a little tiny dog, you know, a little Toto, who unveils reality, what is truly happening. Brothers, it's, it's other kinds of illusions that we've adopted because of our life circumstances when we've been hurt or we've learned things and we, we get set in our ways. We begin to see things in a certain way. And that vision gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's what happens to us unless we're committed to the one who will open up for us reality in its largest sense and help us drop those illusions. And so we see these guys who are walking along. Jesus comes up alongside of them and he enters into the conversation. And you notice how he operates? I mean, he doesn't operate like this big, powerful Oz. He enters into the conversation. He asks questions. What's, what, what were you talking about? And he allows them to talk. And there's that divine permission, that wonderful mercy and compassion that Jesus listens to them. He listens to their anxious hearts. He feels their sadness, their deep sadness and loss because they've lost a picture, an illusion, but a picture of who they think the Messiah is supposed to look like. As good Jews, the Messiah is supposed to be not just somebody who liberates them kind of spiritually and all of this, but he's supposed to liberate them physically, militarily, set them free from Roman rule, set them free from oppressive kinds of rulers. That's what the Messiah is supposed to do in their mind. He thought he was the one to redeem Israel. What a flop. What a failure. And so there's that loss. They're grieving in their hearts. We've lost a great guy. I guess he wasn't Messiah, but he's a cool friend. We learned so much from him. And so Jesus just listens to all this. And then Jesus says, unmindful ones. I, I don't like the word foolish. It's poor translation. It means that they're not using their minds. And it's not just using their heads. It's the fullness of their thinking process. They're not thinking stuff through. And slow of heart. Their hearts are slow. And with their minds and their hearts, they're unable to believe or trust. And here's the thing. That the Messiah had to suffer. Because the idea of a suffering God just... That ain't in our picture. He's all powerful. He's in control. He, you know, uh, he's like other gods, like other religious kinds of deities and things like that. He's powerful. He can stomp on the enemies and all of this. The cross didn't weigh in to what they had figured was supposed to happen. And Jesus says he had to suffer. He had to suffer in order to enter into his glory. Now, we've talked about the word glory. Pops up in the Bible a lot. Glory this, glory to God. You know, there's a, a glory of, of human beings. There's a glory of God. And the word glory means the, the expression of someone's true inner self, what they're made out of. It's an expression. Glory is an expression of what your core looks like, what your heart looks like. What makes you tick? Not what you think makes you tick or the masks that we put on. It's what really makes you tick. That's your glory in all of your glory. And when we talk about the glory of God or the glory of Jesus or the glory of the Messiah, this is what makes God tick, is that he suffered for us. Not just once on the cross, but the cross was an indicator of something that God has been doing for all eternity. That when stuff gets broken, God doesn't just snap his fingers and say, boom, fix it. He's not the great cosmic fixer in that way. He takes that brokenness 
into himself and experiences it fully. This is important. And suffers. You say, well, God suffers, but God's all powerful. That's part of the deal. This is the picture that Jesus gives us. And it goes against a lot of our kind of religious thinking. That God has to suffer. Why? Because we need to know what is the core of God's heart. What makes God tick? What is the very substance of God? The Bible calls it love. And that's what love looks like. You will go to any length necessary, even when it doesn't look good for you. Even when life gets hard for you, you will go to any length necessary to make sure that those around you Experience a good life. It's sharing the good life with others, even when it costs you dearly. That's what love looks like. That is the nature of God. And that's what explodes these guys' illusion of who God is. Now, we referred last week to deconstruction. Okay, that's one of the phases in spiritual growth. These guys are getting deconstructed in a major way. Their whole theology, their whole idea about God, about life is being deconstructed, blown apart. But that's a necessary part of spiritual growth. But then they get reconstructed in some new ways. They get some clues, and it's not just the stuff that Christ says, not just the stuff that Jesus says to them, the words alone, but it's what he does. He willingly comes up alongside them and enters into their conversation. God, he doesn't wait until they get their heads screwed on right or, or get their hearts right. He comes in and enters in right where they are and enters into the conversation, lets them talk, listens to them. A God who listens. That's radical. And then, and then he walks along with them and looks like he's going to go further. And they go, no, 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 stay. Evening, darkness, you don't want to be out there. Wild animals, bad people, robbers, come in with us. And they offer that kind of hospitality in the desert. Come in, eat something with us. Stay with us, stay overnight, at least till, till, until morning. Don't go out there, bad, darkness. So he comes in with them. And he sits down. They don't have chairs, you remember, it's like these real low tables. He sits down with them. And all he does is he takes it, and there's usually a loaf of bread. It's not like Sunday morning service or something like this. It's not like, we're going to have communion here. No, Jesus simply sits down, and he blesses God, and he breaks the bread, and he shares it. Bing! <laughs> they get it. It's him. It's him. And as soon as they recognize him, almost like they're, you can almost see him wanting to reach out and give him a hug or touch him. He vanishes. He disappears from their sight. And they go, wow. And they go from slow of heart. Notice the transition. Slow of heart. Weren't our hearts burning inside? When he talked to us, when he walked with us, and then when he broke the bread, that's it. And their hearts go from slowness to a burning inside. Jesus has just awakened a passion inside of them. And the three things that Jesus does at the table and this is my, this is what I see in it. You don't have to. But I see the three, the three parts of the cycle of spiritual growth. Because in the first part, Jesus blesses God. Blesses the bread, blesses God. Sends out a blessing that just shines out. And that's construction phase. That's the first phase. And we're feeling good about that. We're going, wow, this is so cool. I feel blessed. I'm so grateful. 
And that's the beginning part of our spiritual journey, or at least one part of the cycle. We live in that blessing. Wow, we live on a great island. Wow, it's not snowing outside. Wow, it's not 25 below zero. Wow, it's a great day. I feel so blessed. And that's construction. We're constructing. Some stuff's been constructed inside. Each time we're grateful, each time we're in awe. God builds stuff into us. And we go, this is so cool. I want to live here. This is my home. And then all of a sudden, it falls apart. Just like a loaf of bread. It's broken. It's torn apart. And we go, what's going on? This is so good. What's going on, God? Are you on vacation? What's happening here? Why aren't you protecting this? This is my reality. You, we built it together. It's torn apart. And that bread represents, we'll, we'll be doing that next Sunday in communion, but the bread represents the body of Christ was torn for us. But it's a picture of what reality looks like. Because our lives get torn apart too, and we go, oh no, it's a flop. I'm hitting a dead wall. I'm done. This is it. I'm dead. Darkness. Jesus says, I don't think so, because there's more. And so out of that deconstruction comes the third part of the cycle. He shares the bread with others. He shares the bread with a simple act, shares the bread with his friends. And that act of giving away, something simple like a piece of bread, maybe it's other things in our lives, but that simple act of sharing takes us into a new resurrection or reconstruction phase takes us into the third phase you can hear more about this you can tune in on youtube or facebook for last week but anyway those are the three parts and it, jesus in his life and in his ministry show us what that's all about ah but letting go letting go that deconstruction thing is so so difficult but it's so, so necessary for us to take the next step. One of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, I've quoted him many times. It's funny how things kind of work out, but, and I didn't know he was going to write it. He starts a new theme every week in his meditations. You can zero in on that if you Google uh, the Center for Action and Contemplation and look for daily meditations. Anyway, I do that. He has a meditation every day. And it just so happened this week starts a new meditation, and he's talking about seeing clearly <laughs> and about our life of illusion and our attachment to illusions. Wow, great minds think alike. <laughs> anyway, he says this at the last part of his meditation. He says, we all play our games cultivating our prejudices and unredeemed vision of the world. Christian scholars have said that all people choose as objective good something that merely appears good to them. No one willingly does evil. Each of us has put together a construct by which we explain why what we do is necessary and good. This is the specialty of the ego, the small or false self that wants to project its agenda, wants to protect its agenda and project itself onto the public stage. We need support in unmasking our false self and in distancing ourselves from our illusions. For this, it is necessary to install a kind of inner observer. Some people talk about a fair witness. At first, that sounds impossible, but with patience and practice, it can be done and even become quite natural. That inner observer, it's the Holy Spirit of truth. And I'd like to talk about just three ways, and you may have your own ways of working with this but three practical ways that we can let go of illusions and embrace the reality 
that Jesus has for us. Okay? You ready? I have to make sure I get these right because I wrote them down. First one. Oh, before we get into that, <laughs> before we get into that, it's because it's just, I guess, admitting or confessing that we do have, we're kind of full of our own prejudices and, and illusions and full of ourselves and all of this sort of thing. It's confessing that thing, kind of finding that humble moment and just saying it's, it's kind of like it's that popular story that, that is circulated and I've used it and you've probably heard it before, but it really fits. It's a, it's a story of a professor. He's a professor of religion. And he teaches comparative religions, and he knows about Christianity, but all religion and beliefs and all that, he's an expert. But the professor travels many, many, many miles to go see this renowned spiritual master. And so the renowned spiritual master is sitting there all calmly and everything, and he's traveled thousands of miles, and he comes in, and the spiritual master has a little tea set all set up for him, and, and he sits down in facing the spiritual master, and he's, he's, he kind of calms himself. This is so exciting. I'm going to learn about you know, what's really going on here in the spiritual realm. And the spiritual master, without saying anything, begins to pour the tea into the professor's cup. And as the professor is going, I'm so excited to be here. This is so cool. I look forward to meeting you and all this. The spiritual master continues to pour the tea and pour the tea until it's all the way full. The cup is all the way full and it's beginning to overflow. And he still continues to pour the tea. And, and the professor bear, doesn't even see it. And then he looks down and he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, enough. He said, it's already too full. There's, there's too much in it. And at that point, the spiritual master stops and he says, ah, he says, that is you. You are too full. You must empty your cup. So before we get into these three things, before we jump into this stuff, take a deep breath. Empty your cup. God, help us. Help us to empty our cups. Our hands are full of trinkets and treasures that we've collected along the way, but we have no capacity for you. Empty our cups, Lord. Help us to learn what we need to learn. In Jesus' name. Okay. Amen. So we look. Now we jump into the first thing. First thing to do is invite the Holy Spirit of truth. And this, it's, this is important. This is an invitation. God's with us all the time. He's ready to act. You know, he's always, never leaves us or forsakes us. But he waits for the invitation. So this is important. Sometimes it's good to even say it out loud. To say it so you can hear it with your ears. Invite the Holy Spirit of truth to deliver you from your illusions. Now it's not like you're going to feel anything. Not like necessarily the sky is going to open up and angels are going to sing and all this stuff. But you've made the invitation. You've given the Spirit a place to stand. So all you say is, okay, God... You show me my illusions. You deliver me from this. This is where the whole Savior thing is. Okay, so that's all. That's all the step is. It takes like two seconds. But you got to mean it, okay? <laughs> Empty your cup. Uh, second step is watch for Jesus to appear in new ways. Watch for Jesus to appear in new ways. He's going to pop up in places. Once you say, okay, wipe the screen clean here. Uh, help my glasses to get unfogged and my vision to be clear. All of a sudden, Jesus is going to pop up in some places you never expected. Cool. So you just, that's what the second step is, just to watch, just to observe. You don't have to do anything. Until the third step. So once you've seen Jesus appear in new ways, and you'll know, you'll know in your heart, you go, well, how do I know if it's the real Jesus? Is this like Alan Ludden? And to tell the truth or something, I'm the real Jesus. I'm, you'll know in your heart. You don't need Alan Ludden or Betty White to, to show you who the real Jesus is. You've got the spirit in your heart. You'll know that you know that you know. There'll be that recognition. Don't get all worried about that. 
Watch for Jesus. And the third thing is to respond to this new vision by risking a new action. By risking a new action. To require a response. To do something that will honor this new sight. Oh, that's Jesus. Okay. Jesus in this person that I never expected would, would be Jesus to me. Or this little child or this animal or tree or whatever it is. That when God speaks to you to honor that by doing something different. It doesn't have to be big. In fact, it's probably better if it's just small, bite-sized. But you can figure that out. But do something. Write somebody a letter. Um, smile at somebody where you, you weren't smiling. Um, um, do, do something different. Say a prayer. Help somebody. Share some bread with somebody. Share some eggs with somebody. Share some, do something different that's out of the ordinary that honors that new vision of Jesus. And it also honors the old vision that you've let go of. Because a lot of our stuff that we're called to let go of isn't bad stuff. I mean, it, it just doesn't work. It's not something we can carry with us into the future. It's just outlived its purpose, perhaps. It's not effective. It's not going to work. So to honor that letting go and to honor that embracing of reality as Jesus is showing you that reality honor it with doing something different do something different in that day it's a little bit like waking up you know you've been sleeping and maybe it's a little bit agitated and you're running from somebody and and your legs aren't working, and you try to get your car started, and the car won't start, and whose car is this anyway? And you know, crazy dream stuff where it's a little bit on the anxious side. You wake up, and it's a beautiful morning, the sun is shining, and you take a deep breath. Oh, glad I'm home, back. I'm glad I'm back in my bed. It's a little bit like waking up, a Waco sleeper, a rise from slumber. Christ is calling your name. And I came across a song to close this morning, came across a song by an ensemble from St. Dominic's Catholic Church in San Francisco, California. Go figure. And this is one of those Zoom ensembles that uh, they put together a wonderful song. If you listen to the lyrics, it's an invitation from the Messiah himself to wake up to a whole new reality that God has for you. And he tailor makes it to each and every one of us. Your deepest needs, your deepest wishes, your greatest dreams pale in comparison to what God has for you. That's coming home to him. No longer do you have to hold on to those illusions. It's coming home to him. Listen to the song.
going to be thinking about that all week, that little tune, you know, is going to be going through our heads. Christ is calling your name. Well, we've come to the end of our broadcast. Uh, thank you, Facebook people and, and future YouTubers, too. Uh, thank you for joining us for this. You can, again, you can post your prayers or responses to this message on Facebook, and we will be lifting up your prayer concerns and rejoicing in your praises and uh, kind of registering your responses. If you have some thoughts about this, please let us know. But we appreciate your prayers and support in all of this. Again, you can find that donation page on uh, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com on the donate tab. And we encourage uh, that prayer and support. We love you. We support you in prayer also. Let's remain together as a community as we move forward in our spiritual walks together. God bless you and have a great week.